Good morning, Blackwell. Good to see you all this morning. And it's good to see all those, well, we can't see them, but all those that have joined us online and that are worshiping with us. We were in our Sunday school lesson this morning. The one thing that hit me, and it hit a couple of other people the same way, is that we do worship the Lord privately on our own, but we come together as the family of God to worship through songs, through scripture, through our sermons, through prayer together collectively, and praising this God that loves us so much that he only expects one day a week. Only one. Spread the word so that we can come together next Sunday, Mother's Day, yes, and that we can once again come to the house of the Lord and praise his name and give him, give him our gratitude for who he is. We are here to praise. We're going to do a praise song called Come. So if you can get up and praise him and put your hands in the air or whatever you do, please join us as we sing Come. Now is the time to worship. Good morning. Good morning. After the National Day of Prayer, I wore this outfit. I don't know if I had the same pants on, but I had the, it has been washed, same shirt and vest. Uh, and then I took Louise to the optometrist, or ophthalmologist it was, and then we stopped at KFC, and while I was there, one of our members, who tells me he watches me on, watches us online, uh, had a little talk with him, and then he noticed I had a tie on. He said, it looks good to have, see you with a tie on, so I thought I'd stick it on for today. A couple reasons for that. One, just to honor that individual. So then my wife saw this and saw this, and she said, uh, you're wearing a blue and white plaid. Folks, the people that are here close up can probably tell you it's blue and white. I thought it was black and white. Pardon? Yes, yeah, a, a woman will get it correct. <laughs> so anyhow, we're glad you're here today. Uh, two weeks from today will be Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we're planning the snack bar will be reopened for that service. Um, 
with red velvet cake, uh, I will be in red that day. I haven't decided about a tie yet. Probably not. Um, read your bulletins. It tells you the boards and committees that are going on this week. Wednesday, we'll begin Chapter 6 in Jerry Savell's book on prayer. Uh, at the moment, there's still two books available. Next Sunday, Mother's Day, Sunday School, 8, 45, and 9, and Worship at 10. I think that's about it. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things to surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We were talking about worship, and that's what our first hymn is, O oh, Worship the King. Please rise if you're able. Let us continue our worship of God with the giving of tithes and offerings.
us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you this morning. We thank you today, O oh God, that we can know your will. We're thankful, O oh God, that you've given us your scripture in the Sunday school class that many of us just came from when we're reminded how you have revealed your word to us. We pray today for those of our midst that are on the road, and there are many, that you will give them safety and have them return home safely. We thank you even today when my own daughter was on the road in western North Carolina. Uh, well, I don't know what's going on now. They were able to get her back off the mountain, get the car to a shop, and then hopefully get it repaired. You're so much you care for us in these little things, oh, Father. We pray today that you will walk with us, guide us, love us. Help us, O oh God, to know that faith is the victory that conquers the world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. You taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sing no one 
our, one of my favorite, favorite gospel songs. Today, we're reading our final sermon from the Epistle of 1 John. Next Sunday, I'll be back in the Old Testament talking about Hannah. Next Sunday, back in the New Testament and the gospel to talk about the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, verses uh, 1 through 5, our text probably really is verses 5 and 6. You can see it in front of you in the Hispanic version. Um, so we have, they're talking about the number of translations. If you go to the Bible Gateway, which I use, I think there's a probably 20 Spanish translations as well. And so this is in front of us. Let us move on now to the reading of the text. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Let me repeat that, if I could. For who, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Then go on to verse 5. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who comes by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. I was thinking of a gospel song that's not in our hymnal here. There's a lot of hymnals around this church that's been used over the last hundred plus years, and every one I looked at except the one in your pew has this song in it. It goes something like this. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Any of you ever heard that song before? Just a couple of you. Wow. That's an old timer. Like I said, it's in every hymnal I found there. Three bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And we're going to talk about those verses some today. But I want to, I was trying to figure out why this song didn't make it into this hymnal. And then I think I suspected it. The first verse is, Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. That's it. That's the problem. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know. That overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. The last verse says, To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How do we overcome the world? Frequently we think of famous generals. One came from nothing and conquered everything. At least that's what Randy Scott's film, Napoleon, said about him, released last fall. They have remarked on these performances of this French general, who really wasn't French, he was really more Italian, and he set out to conquer the whole world, or all of Europe. 
and there's one way he succeeded. Unlike those Brits that thought they should drive in the right lane, should drive in the left lane, the steering wheel on the right hand side, he decreed that all his country should drive on the right side, was driver on the left. And when the United States annexed uh, what we call the Louisiana Purchase, or purchased it from them, lo and behold, they all brought it in. And those of us that are from the East Coast, we follow suit. So today, unlike the Brits, we drive with the steering wheel on the left side and the right side road. He did have something that affects us to this moment. Now, isn't that an amazing piece of trivia that probably doesn't mean a hill of beans? <laughs> but let's talk on about him. He really did come from nothing. He was born on a remote Mediterranean island of Corsica, faced discrimination as a young army officer because he had an Italian name, Buonaparte. But he changed it to the French name, Bonaparte. He spent his career on the outward fringes of respectability, wasn't too visible, but in his early career, they had a real bloodbath in France, and because of that, not a lot of people were left standing after that carnage uh, where all the leaders had been to the guillotine. And Napoleon was a gifted individual. He never saw a uh, power vacuum he didn't want to fill. And there it was. And so when they had a big deal, he arranged for the remaining royalists to be seized. And that's how come France doesn't have royalty. Uh, they, they killed them all. You've all heard the story about Marie Antoinette when they came complaining they wanted to have bread, and she said, well, let them have cake. You all heard that one when you were younger? Yeah, some of you did. They were gone, and he ordered his men to load the cannons with grape shot and turn them on the mob of aristocrats. And they say the cobblestones or the cobblestones of Paris literally ran red with blood. And after the smoke cleared, this fierce Cors Corsica military officer was the most powerful man in France. Well, he didn't stop there. He seized on the moment. His army would overrun almost all of continental Europe. By 1812, his empire stretched from Spain on the west to Poland and Austria on the east. But he kept on going and he made a mistake. He could have quit while he was ahead, but he decided to go into Russia. And as the Russians say, General Winter defeated him. His overconfident soldiers outran their supply lines. Many of them still wearing their summer uniforms, starved to death in the snowbanks. The least of Russian soldiers, warmed and warm with their heavy fur coats, came out and they took short work of the rest. He got back to power, and then he went and met a guy named Wellington. I guess he thought he wanted England as well. And as they say, it is there that he met his Waterloo, and he spent all of his days as the most famous prisoner in all the world on a remote island in the South Atlantic. In his early days, it looked like he was conquering the world. And it didn't stop with him. What about some other names you might have heard of? Have you ever heard the name Adolf Hitler? He set out to conquer the world. Uh, I've been watching the news this week, and let me make a comment. They've got some professors that need to go to Europe and see the Holocaust museums. I've lived long enough that I know people that were in those camps. I remember one day a woman called me a very German brogue and talked with me. She ended up coming to the church. She joined the church. As a young teen, she had been, I think she must have been gypsy in heritage. She must have been. She had been part of those camps. I've had them sitting in my pews right about where Buck is sitting right now. I believe in the Holocaust. I'm not like some that say it didn't happen. So what is the solution? Stalin came along. He didn't win. I could name some others, but I'll stop while I'm ahead because I want to suggest to you that our text says, he who overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. 
So that song, Faith is a Victory, came straight out of this passage. An interesting side note, the guy that wrote this started out Methodist and he ended up Baptist. Just thought some of you might like that. Um, it's the, not just faith, though. It's faith in the Son of God that overcomes the world. I want to look a little bit more about and unpack this a bit today. It's close to 2,000 years since Jesus conquered death. Probably some of the best dates is he died around A.D. 29. Some may go a year or two earlier, but we're getting close to the 2,000-year mark. But he redeemed the world. This past week, it seemed to be my week to meet people. I met an individual I'd never met before. And she said something that I really think she has right, at least at some levels, because I believe our salvation was accomplished on the cross. But it is only effective when we accept the gift and make it our own. Christ gave his life for us and invites us. He doesn't force us. He invites us to give ourselves to him. It's a gracious and it is a gentle invitation, not a command. In Revelation 3.20, we read these words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. One of my favorite pictures shows Jesus knocking on the door. Any of you may have seen some of those pictures, like Warner Sarman? You know where the doorknob is? On the inside. God doesn't force us to open up that door. He knocks, and if any man hear my voice, I will come in and sup with him. Every salvation story is unique. I believe everyone has a context. Coming to Christ is a change of direction. But it's more than a change of direction. It's more than a change of where we go. It's a change of how we go. It's more than a change of where we go, but a change of how we go. Uh, the old joke is, why did it take Moses 40 years to go across the wilderness? And some woman said, it's simple. He was a man, and he wouldn't stop and ask for directions. Yes, my friends, it's how we go as well. Two principles today that we're going to look at briefly. One is the great witness of the Trinitarian God of Orthodox Christianity. Here are the words in verse 7. We read, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. There are some groups that claim to be Christian that don't believe this verse, and others that have the same idea. We sang that song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise thee. That's another Trinitarian song. Yesterday, and, and incidentally, if you're wondering where that is, if you look at your hymnal, it's number two, but it's really the first hymn. Number one's a reading. Um, the last, first and last verse ends with these words, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. There is truth that we have a God who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. A guide in the past, present, and future. The human mind is incapable of grasping this. But yet I do have, well, one, I'm one person, but to my son, I'm dad. To my father, I am son. To my spouse, I am husband. Different roles, but the same person. God has different roles, but the same person. I have come to believe that one of the biggest problems we have in our, the world of Christ followers today is that we don't really and truly grasp this part of God. Because our human mind is incapable of understanding it. We can't grasp it. We can't grasp all there is about created beings. The story is told of how they were going to have a contest with man and he was going to show God how he could create. And the first thing he did was he took some dirt. And God said, no, get your own dirt. 
We need what God has given us. We may not understand all there is about creation, but the Bible is witness enough to tell us all we need to know about it. You can debate all these theories about how God created, and I may or may not agree with you, but I'll tell you what I will say. The answer is all found in the first four words. In the beginning, God. You, the rest of it, we, we'll know when we need to know, if we need to know. In the beginning, God. We also read this in the Gospel of John and the first epistle of John, where we keep seeing our Creator frequently referred to as the Father, but we also meet our Redeemer, who was from the beginning and became flesh and dwelt among us. We also meet the Holy Spirit breathing over the earth in the dawn of creation. But in two short weeks, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit in a different way when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers in Jerusalem. And what a day it was. They baptized 3,000 people. I'll tell you, the most I've ever baptized is 21. I don't know if I'd, I... I bet you they had more than one person doing the baptizing. What do you think? It was a great day. And two weeks from today, we will celebrate that. It's a birthday, you know. Birthday, cake, balloons, red. We need to match the carpet here, don't we? (laughs) Continuing our understanding of the Trinity on earth, we read these words. There are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. When Jesus walked on the face of this earth, He was limited to time and place. So he said, when I come, I will send you a comforter. Well, the comforter is not limited to time and space. The Holy Spirit can be with us everywhere. The gospel writer said, he's with me everywhere, and we need to remember that. But Jesus said to them after ascension, Go, go back, and tarry. And so they did. And 120 people got together and had a big prayer meeting in the upper room. They were days of preparation. And then on Pentecost Sunday, which is a harvest in the Hebrew faith, they went out front, and they were quoting the prophet Joel, and it says, and every person heard in his own language. What a thought. Yes, It breathed over the earth. Flames of fire came. The Spirit bears witness on this earth. The Spirit can be everywhere, for the Spirit is our comforter. So we've talked about that. Let it go on. He said, the Spirit, then water. What about water? I've been around water a little bit. I was privileged to to see the Atlantic Ocean at a fairly young age the Indian Ocean at a little bit older age, and the Pacific Ocean later yet. But I've never saw the Arctic Ocean or the Southern Ocean and have no desire to see either. Um, I've led people or waited for people to come into the waters of baptism from a variety of places, including one time the Atlantic Ocean, creeks, Rivers, farm ponds, swimming pools, church baptistries. But the symbolism of baptism found in Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised to the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. But yet it says three witnesses. We've mentioned the spirit, we've mentioned the water, but we also mentioned the blood. The ordinances of the church normally include baptism and the the Lord's Supper. The symbol in baptism is water. The symbol of the Lord's Supper is wine or the blood of Christ. Except if you're a Baptist or a Methodist, you make it grape juice. Uh, And that's still the fruit of the vine, which one of the Gospels uses. I have no problem with it. I think this is so powerful. The blood of Christ will never lose its power. William Cooper, spelled C-O-W-P-E-R, wrote a hymn that's in this hymnal. 
There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. But guilty as he was, he was a man that suffered manic depression or at least some type of depression. He wasn't able to maintain a job. For a number of years, he lived on a cottage of another well-known hymnist, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. But I think out of all that depression that came out of him and all his worries about his salvation, he got it. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The blood of Jesus covers all our sins. Jesus embraces us. Jesus cleanses us. And Jesus walks with us in our daily living. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn. And I'm going to invite you to go with me to Calvary, the place where Jesus shed his blood. Because the world will never be saved by the shedding of blood on the battlefield. Remember all the generals? They're gone. But it has already been saved. All we have to do is take advantage of it by the shedding of blood on the cross of Calvary. Perhaps today you have not been to Calvary. You have not invited Christ in when he knocked on the door. But you hear the knock this morning. Christ will not force the door. But if you will take that door because the handle's on the inside and open it, he will come in. And if you are a representative to Christ to talk to somebody else, remember, God gave the handle for them, not you. Don't force it. Let God love you. Let us join together in our hymn of response. 211.
lest I forget Gethsemane. Let us not forget it. Let us remember he came. He gave us the water. He gave us the wine, the blood. He just gave it all so we could have eternal life. Go in peace. Amen.